What does white allyship mean to you? Right. Um, to me, it means, uh, as a leader, being prepared to uh, speak up about anti-racism and provide a platform for people to share um, what needs to change to create environments where everyone feels the NHS is their NHS. Mm. Thank you. Alex? So, uh, for me, stepping into a space of white allyship is about... Firstly, for me, just being much, much more thoughtful mm. um, around the needs of others and then understanding my own position in the organisation as a, a white middle class male mm. uh, in a senior position in an NHS trust um, and what responsibility that brings uh, to turn those thoughts into action mm -hmm. uh, around that Okay, Thanks, Alex. Sarah? Um, for me, I think... Um, leadership's a lot about what questions you ask and how you listen and it's about making sure that I'm thinking about anti-racism in the in a pointed way in the questions I'm asking so that everyone knows it's really important it's front of, front of mind for everyone in the organisation. What was the turning point for you in terms of realising that there needed to be a greater focus on race equality at Brimley Health and Care, Integrated Care System um, and the importance of being kind of anti-racist? So my uh, mentor, Necker Mackenzie, who was so courageous sharing some of her uh, lived experience in the NHS. And then I was sharing my inhibition as a white leader in speaking up uh, about uh, institutional racism and really trying to be a good uh, anti-racist ally. And uh, she uh, just said to me, you invalidate me with your silence. Mm. And that just, I, it's so easy, it just went right into my heart. Mm. And so uh, uh, what a gift that was for me, yeah. And I suppose following on from that now, so we're talking about anti-racism and we've been using that then words. What, what are the challenges then of uh, embedding um, anti-racism at system level? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'll start with organisations needing to um, get into this new space, well not new space, but a space of anti-racism to help the system. Because if you've just got one or two organisations uh, addressing racism and discrimination, you're not going to get the system change that you need. Mm -hmm. uh, but conversely, and I'll use the EDI conference we had in the Frimley system, mm -hmm. um, we had all of our stakeholders and partners in that room back in last October hearing about anti-racism and how it can shift systems and organisations mm. into a new space of action. So I think we have to do the work at the same time, but uh, we've, we've taken inspiration from that work in the, in the conference. We were just starting to think, how can we shift on our workforce race equality standard? Mm. And it's about shifting the organisation and the system mm. into a new mindset, really, a mm. courageous space to be able to talk mm. about racism in a way we've never talked about it before. Yeah. Uh, and if we can get all parts of the system, not just my organisation or another organisation doing it, we're going to get some really good change. Yeah, mm. definitely. And, and if you would see the kind of a key challenge for you to do doing that at Berkshire, what would you say? There's probably a few, but just to... Well, we, we have just started our engagement, mm. uh, truthfully, around anti-racism, and it started with the board. Uh, there's a... A vulnerability isn't there about individuals mm. that sit around the board table uh, we had a fantastic seminar um, where we were able to share our own perspectives and feelings about the anti-racist mm. agenda and where we were coming from and it was a really really important conversation because I don't think you can start anti-racism unless the board is yeah. really behind you on this whether it's a system board an organization board um, and we were able to share you know, our own vulnerabilities and understanding around it and some of the pain and um, you know, kind of consequence on individuals of not stepping into a space of anti-racism and just watching what's happened. Yeah. So I thought that was really powerful for us to get there. And out of that seminar came, we need to set an, an anti-racist action statement as an organisation. Mm -hmm. And we're beginning to engage deeper into the organisation now around that. And of course, it's about layers uh, within organisations and systems. It's not just going to be held mm. uh, as a commitment at the top. Um, we need to peel back and understand the granularity of our workforce data, our res data, our staff experience, because there are different forms and perspectives of discrimination and racism that's yeah. happening in different areas. Yeah. So I think one of the big challenges is to 
what the mother of Alex was saying is to accept this is a problem and it's mm. a problem mm. that we own. It is our problem. Mm. Um, and I think that that is a big transition from oh we're an inclusive organisation everyone's welcome to it actually it's our it's our it's our problem mm -hmm. we need to make sure that this is not a racist organisation and that everybody uh, can thrive in it mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it maybe that everyone's in slightly different places in the journey but I think that's still a big step owning it yeah mm -hmm. is um, it's quite a challenge sometimes. Yeah. you have to really be quite rigorous mm -hmm. about um, if so remember the primary purpose of integrated care systems is to tackle health inequalities mm. and so um, and I fundamentally believe that that creating addressing discrimination around all protected characteristics but particularly racism mm. um, will help you address health inequalities because it's a, a fundamental shift in how uh, in the um, the mindset with which we've developed and run organisations in public service mm -hmm. for, for decade, decades. So, um, so, so we work really hard when we set up the Integrated Care Board to ensure that we recruited to the board, particularly with the um, uh, two demographic aspects of our population. One was the uh, uh, ethnicity of our population and tw just under 25% of the population across the Frimley system are from black Asian minority ethnic backgrounds and also just over 50% are women mm. and so we can't so we just started there because to try to do everything mm -hmm. and it, and people will feel it's even that's an unacceptable compromise but it was hard work mm. to really consciously map into your recruitment processes, working with your recruiting partner to prioritise this mm -hmm. in, ter in terms of the, the candidates and making sure we get the field and the access right. So is there something about the people that you have in mm -hmm. your boards and making sure you have diversity that reflects some of the issues that you've got to shift. You've talked about kind of patients and communities reducing health inequalities but just building on that what is the value of embed embedding anti-racism at system level and you talked earlier about some of the work they started doing can you just go into that a little bit further? In fact we're, you know we're, we're part of a system that needs to address health inequalities mm. um, and we've thought for a while now what's the impact we can make with the system but also as an organisation in terms of our areas of responsibility, the population we're serving. Uh, one example is uh, a long known issue around health inequalities of, of black male mental health act detention mm. um, and we are focusing on this laser focus. It, it might be seen as niche but in terms of the impact on the black male population who suffer mental health mm. there is something going wrong mm. Um, where people are not able to access the service they need at the time they need and they're ending up in crisis and into our services being detained disproportionately across our uh, unitary authority areas in, in Berkshire. Mm. So there's very clear data uh, and inequality evidence there and we are having a very good go now at addressing what's been quite an intractable issue and it's going to need a system partnership mm. approach to delivering on the, on the answers and, and the, uh, the way of dealing with that. So uh, lots of root cause analysis to try and understand and then taking a system approach to putting in um, you know, earlier intervention, picking people up when they're not being picked up. Um, and that's gonna be about you know, people understanding the services available, how we support people to access by going to them and bringing them forward into services when they need them. Um, so it's, it's about system work on inequalities and about organizations picking up where we know things are happening that we need to address. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Sarah, so what practices as a partner in the Brimley Health and Care System have you taken or would you like to take in terms of building um, anti-racism into your overall work and strategy? So I think uh, the health inequality data uh, is really powerful mm -hmm. um, and one of the first things we're doing is looking well okay well how do hospices fit into that do we know enough about um, where all our patients and their families are and what they want um, so we're starting off by doing some really basic um, postcode mapping to see whether um, we are actually representative of the population we serve we think we might not be we don't know yet we'll find out um, the other thing that we're doing um, is 
starting to think about how we redesign our services so that they work for communities who might approach uh, end of life differently mm. and want a different kind of service from the model that was originally set up um, in the hospice movement. And that's really interesting about the role of family and the role of community and who gets involved in decisions. Um, and that model where it's the partner, um, that's, too, that's not subtle enough, that's not inclusive enough. So we're just starting to think about um, how do we do that in a sustained way. And it's fascinating, it's really interesting, but you do have to go right back to, to basics, basics. Um, and think it through from, from that person's perspective. What do they need? Not do we as an organisation want to provide. Yeah. Thank you. We were looking at building an anti-racism alliance with all our voluntary sector across Brimley, so everybody's involved. And part of that as well is looking at things like race hate crime, because mm. some of our obviously our colleagues will experience hate crime in the community when they're coming into work, when they're at work, when they're travelling in between. Yeah. Um, so it'd be good to get people's thoughts on how important it is that actually we we do it as a as a full system, including you know, the police, fire service, students, university, you know, so it is a kind of full system approach. I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts on, on the importance or how that might work. I, I think it's really important to do to raise the system's consciousness mm -hmm. around what we actually mean by anti-racism. So we're all talking from the same voice uh, and we're taking the same kind of assertive, proactive, explicit action mm. when we see discrimination, uh, racism, health inequality in the system and there's something about the collective power of bringing as many into that journey mm -hmm. as possible so I think it's very important to do and I the, our board at Berkshire Healthcare deciding to determine a, an action related statement around anti-racism which clarifies the language uh, clarifies the intent I think it will just really translate well uh, mm -hmm. across wider system. Yeah. I think we have to accept though, that lots of people will be really uncomfortable mm -hmm. um, so your point about giving the language to make it a bit less uncomfortable is important but I also think lots of really practical steps for how you can help because on the whole people want to do the right thing mm. they might just not really be very comfortable in mm. it and it might be easier just to ignore it than to engage with it so making it so that it's easier to engage with than not engage with mm -hmm. that's the that's the trick that we need to pull somehow. Mm. I think some of the the challenge we're having and will continue to have in the organisation is around the not racist view I'm not racist and misunderstanding what anti-racism means, mm -hmm. which is, you know, as an individual, as an organisation, as a system, taking a stand and being explicit about that. Yeah. So I think we've got to create that mm. that discomfort conversation mm. and bring that out across the system, because um, I think that will forge and shape yeah. from there. Yeah. Do you remember when you started with, in the, in the system and um, the challenge over the term anti-racism? Mm. Uh, in our people board, mm -hmm. amongst different groups, because people's anxiety about being racist um, thinks that that term is a criticism of mm -hmm. them, um, and uh, we just stuck with it. You stuck with it, mm -hmm. we stuck with it in different fora, and then people started to get it, didn't mm -hmm. they, and engage with it. and so. So I think the challenge around working and building an alliance is what, you, what actually people really want help mm -hmm. to do this work. Okay, so um, so the, the, the next question is, how have your conversations on race and anti-racism changed since you started this work? So we've kind of gone into that a little bit, but anyone want to...? Take this one on, um, on Sarah. <laughs> for me personally, I've just started asking questions more and accepting that the discomfort I might feel is my problem, not anybody else's. Mm. Um, and so if we're talking about a new service or we're talking about how something's going, I will just say, how does uh, how do our ethnic minority staff feel about that? Mm. Um, and just asking the questions on almost every issue just sends a quite powerful signal that I will be asking that so that people probably better find out about it if they hadn't already. My recent learning has been um, how as a leader you can't you cannot be glib in this space you cannot be dismissive in this space and you cannot be transactional you know you say okay I'll do this um, because actually people when they're speaking up and sharing their ex lived experience are often deeply traumatized 
um, you know, it is abuse. Yeah. Uh, any form of discriminatory act is abuse. Mm -hmm. and, I've, I, and I've learned that. So when you have conversations, even if they're set piece conversation with staff networks, you have to be deeply respectful mm. of the trauma that somebody is describing to you when they're mm. sharing their experience. And um, it's not okay to push for people yeah. and that responsibility. Actually, you don't need that much to be able to act as a leader. Mm. And is there something then that the likelihood is on this kind of journey, you might say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing? So how, what advice, would you give then in terms of people listen to this in terms of what if, what if you do say or do the wrong thing I, I think you you've got to go into your conversations with a bit of vulnerability and a bit of openness yeah. to say I may you know may say yeah. the wrong thing mm -hmm. um, kind of please accept that and help me correct it where mm -hmm. I have gone wrong and I think when you go into the conversations like that it opens up we had a, a staff networks day last uh, last week for National Staff Networks. And I've just noticed as we continue our engagement, early engagement around anti-racism, what that language means, it's opening up um, kind of more conversations than we've ever had before with our new race equality network. And there's just subtle shifts, aren't there? We used to have a BAME network. We've now got a race equality network. And there's just an alignment. There's something about timing that's happening here as well. We shied away as an organization only six to 12 months ago around anti-racism. We're now really, really wanting to get into it because we can see it will shift the mindset into action focus. And if I'm honest, we've been watching our race equality data for too long being static. Mm. Uh, and I talk about the kind of corporate level commitment to anti-racism, but we have to have a laser focus to where we can make the changes and where we need to make the changes. And I think a key element is communicating your success. And we got feedback from the Race Equality Network. You're not telling us about the work that you're doing. So for example, in our HR casework, we have significantly reduced formal disciplinary and grievances overall by taking a just culture, mm -hmm. no blame approach, but we've also reduced the incidence of black, Asian and minority ethnic likelihood. Mm -hmm. uh, people going into those process to, to near proportion now of our staff, which is a fantastic shift. Mm -hmm. We were something up around 50-60% of uh, black, Asian, minority, ethnic colleagues. Um, we're now down to near 30% with a 28% staff profile. Mm -hmm. So really, really quite significant changes that we can communicate um, because this is all about action. Uh, we can't just talk about anti-racism. We feel as an organisation, really, this is one of our last chances to do something around this agenda. And so we've got to communicate where the action's being taken and where the impact is happening mm. for people that's beneficial. Mm. What tangible changes have you seen or would like to see as a result of some of the actions that you've talked about? Uh, we've got to do our next five year strategy quite mm -hmm. soon. Um, and I would really like to see some of the principles, it's an overused word, but co-design and some of the principles of co-design being taken forward by our own teams mm -hmm. and people who in the organisation might not have felt very empowered in the past but it's our job as the leadership team to say, okay, for you, what would work, what wouldn't, and what kind of an organisation do you want to, to work in in the future? So that's something that's definitely in the next 12 to 18 months for us. Thanks, Sarah. Alex? I'd really like to see us pushing on for our um, making Berkshire Healthcare and the system a great place to work properly for all. Um, if you look at our staff survey results, there is still too high a level of bullying, harassment mm. and discrimination. And that's in an organisation with a top engagement score mm. uh, for its sector. And I think what we need to take from that is look at your data, don't dwell on the data, but use it to focus and decide on the metrics that you want to shift. Mm. Um, and so career progression for us, we have in low turnover in lower banded black, Asian, minority, ethnic staff, higher turnover in white staff and our career progression into the upper bands is not where we need it to be. Mm -hmm. So again, this is where a focus will start to come around our talent approach. Mm -hmm. You know, inclusive talent management has to be a major part of progression for people and retention overall. Uh, so that will be a focus for us going forward. Brilliant, thank you. I'd like to see um, a real shift in uh, public sector leadership um, and more diversity mm -hmm. across all partners as well as in health mm -hmm. um, and so that 
uh, you know, the, the, the front line, hugely diverse teams mm -hmm. that we all employ, um, that we see that diversity reflected more in our boards, but also see the diversity of our um, uh, communities reflected, and that uh, and that's NHS boards, that's voluntary sector boards, that's um, leadership uh, arrangements in our local authority partners mm. as well. So that and uh, 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 I, I believe fundamentally we will. We, we see the will emerging mm. to achieve, achieve those changes. Um, and uh, there are some serious, I'd, practically, I'd like to see more, um, now this is where I hesitate because I'm not sure of the terminology, more black, black men mm. and black women yeah. in senior le leadership yeah. positions. Mm -hmm. it, what we will see as a result of this shift, if we get it, if we get any movement in a really inclusive environment, is our service mo models will change, and there there will be more community engagement, out of hospital focused, mm -hmm. and we'll be using our resources more wisely, um, and we'll be addressing the financial challenges that we've all got in the NHS and in public services, and people's health and well-being, uh, and their abilities in communities to really manage and support that with a little bit of help. We'll see a real shift. Mm -hmm. I think I fundamentally see all of that as um, absolutely connected. Mm -hmm. One top tip you would share with senior colleagues who are kind of embarking on this journey of anti-racism and white allyship. So, what would that be? My top tip is um, don't rely uh, or lean on your EDI team to do this. This is uh, a senior leadership board commitment to anti-racism. Mm -hmm. That you then go and engage in courageous conversations, difficult conversations, uh, change your language, make it simple, be really clear about what you want to do, um, and I think that is is key to success. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Alex. Sarah. And mine would be um, to go back to the basics of why people come to work, um, and most people in health, I think, have a real passion for it, and they mm -hmm. want to do the right thing, and they want everyone to have the best possible experience. We're in the 75th year of the NHS, and the NHS was founded on uh, fundamental principles of social justice. Mm -hmm. And so my top tip to leaders is to remember that, and remember and really think about the nature and makeup of the communities and people we serve now, 75 years into mm -hmm. this fabulous institution that was invented you know, I still think it's the best invention of this country. Mm -hmm. um, that that being anti-racist and an ally is a fundamental component to delivering social justice as a leader in public service. Brilliant. Thanks, Fiona.